We're half an hour away from the open in Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Shanghai. You're watching The China Show. I'm Yvonne Mann. Our top stories this morning, rising tensions in the Middle East weigh on Asian stocks while Brent crude holds steady. Metals, including aluminum, spiking on the new U.S. and U.K. sanctions when it comes to Russia supplies. The world awaiting Israel's next move as G7 countries urge restraint, and Iran signals a bigger response to any further Israeli strikes. And Germany's Olaf Scholz set to warn China on its business practices, even as he seeks to dial down tensions in his second visit as chancellor. busy Monday morning here. You take a look at how the market action has been following, of course, this Iran attack on Israel. You are seeing a little bit of a risk aversion here when it comes to stocks. So traders are really coming through in this Monday morning with selling equities. They're flocking a little bit to that dollar, although we're seeing a bit of a steadiness uh, when it comes to the greenback in the Asia session. But sovereign bonds have actually caught a slight bid here today, uh, despite what you're seeing in that U.S. 10-year. But really, there has been something that we've seen in the sovereigns here this morning. What you're not seeing is dollar yen, right? at 153 hasn't really been that haven sort of currency of late here but there has been a little bit at least stabilization here and you're really not seeing that that risk risky moves or those risk off moves when it comes to oil prices right take a look at Brent we're actually heading lower here this morning gold after briefly touching 2400 we're, we're, we're back footing a little bit as well so in some cases you could argue that markets are taking this in stride but it's not just the Middle East news we're also following what's been going on with the U.S. and U.K., implementing sanctions against Russian metal metals, including copper, aluminum, as well as nickel. That's why you're seeing uh, most of them, in particular aluminum and nickel, surging. Uh, these are the LME contracts, of course. Gold, we mentioned just earlier. But you take a look at how the, the, some of these commodity futures in China, whether we do see any sort of catch-up, that certainly is what you're seeing here today. Uh, aluminum futures in, in China up 2.5%. Uh, we just had that call from Goldman, interesting enough, when it comes to gold. 2700 is their 2024 forecast now. They said it's an unshakable gold market that we're seeing. You take a look when it comes to the setup in China, not just the Middle East news, but really you talk about what we saw with the trade data on Friday that missed expectations. You have the state council meeting vowing to pledge tighter market supervision. That certainly sent the Nasdaq Golden Dragon uh, hitting a, a big drop there uh, on Friday. And then you have also news of... Uh, uh, you know, we have earnings coming up, CATL. You have Citic and High Tone Securities being probed by regulators. So there's a lot on tap here this morning. And you take a look at what goes on. Futures are slightly on the back foot. 726.30 for your dollar China trade here this morning. In terms of what to watch in greater China, today we're looking a little bit more on terms of the monetary policy side of things. That one year MLF rate coming out in just a few minutes. Energy stocks, as we've been talking about, just given the Middle East tension, CATL earnings. Schultz in China as well, quite timely, just given what we've been hearing in the Middle East as well. We've heard the China response to these Iran attacks also. The CSI 300, we're down for seven days. It's the longest losing streak we've seen in four years. And of course, some of those statements that we're hearing from the state council when it comes to stock market supervision kind of brings us back to what we heard back in February when it comes to what they were doing with quants as well. I want to bring in now our Greater China Senior Executive Editor, John Liu. He's going to be joining me this hour from Beijing. John, I mean, it's a busy, busy day and week. What's going to stand out the most to you? I think the first thing we got to look out for is that MLF. Uh, the consensus is that the PBOC is going to leave it in place. It's not going to move. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. You've got to imagine the central bank has got one eye on the currency. Uh, that has been under a lot of pressure as of late. If they were to cut with uh, rates the way they are in the U.S., I think that would obviously put even more pressure there. We also, this being the month of April, will have a Politburo meeting at the end of the month focused on the economy. Uh, so I think uh, given the political climate, uh, given the conservative nature that Beijing has showed uh, it's in, uh, it seems like uh, a cut would be really unlikely. If we, if we did get a move, I think it would be, uh, come as quite a shock to the market. 
Yeah, and we'll certainly see how that uh, pans out here, but certainly you're going to be here with me this hour to kind of ride through all this. Uh, in the meantime, let's get you caught up with our top story this morning. Iran has called its attack on Israel a success. It is warning the U.S. to stay out of the conflict. Now, Tehran launched a barrage of drone and missiles against Israel on Saturday in its first direct attack on the Jewish state. Most of the salvo was intercepted by Israel and its allies, but at least one girl we've learned was left badly injured. Tehran says the attack was in retaliation for an Israeli strike in Syria that killed top military officials. From our point of view, this operation is over and there's no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. Last night was approved that Iran seeks escalation. Iran launched over 350 threats, ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, rockets, and suicide drones towards Israel and also other countries in the region could have got that threat on the way. Iran doesn't just pose a threat to Israel, Iran poses a threat to the entire Middle East and we also heard from the Chinese envoy to the UN, Ambassador Dai Bing, saying that the fundamental way out is to fully implement the, quote, two-state solution. Now, China is also calling on the international community to play a constructive role in maintaining regional peace and stability. I want to bring in Simon Frankel Pratt now. He's a lecturer in political science at the University of Melbourne. He joins us now. Professor, it's, it's great to have you. I mean, before we get to the China sort of response, I want to get your take on this overall, what we heard over the weekend. It seems like from the Iranian side that this was a full operation, as they say, they don't plan on any follow-up attacks, but are we still at risk of a full regional war with Iran? Uh, well, look, uh, Iran has said, oh, you know, this is one and done. We're, we're, uh, we, we consider the incident over. We have successfully retaliated against the strike on our, uh, on our embassy. But of course, uh, other countries than Iran get a say here. And it is ultimately up to Israel uh, whether or not it retaliates. That said, I think that there's a lot of pressure on Israel from the United States and other regional allies not to respond or to respond in a very restrained way. Uh, the U.S. in particular, uh, the Biden administration is very anxious that this not escalate into uh, tit-for-tat strikes. And um, while Netanyahu has long thirsted for a war with Iran, I'm not sure he would have the support of his own uh, security apparatus to uh, embark on one. So I would say the possibility of an escalation is there, but I wouldn't panic. And I think that probably we'll see this uh, uh, de-escalate. And Simon, maybe you could talk a bit more. I mean, even beside, as you mentioned there, behind the scenes, there seemed to have been a lot of diplomacy. You know, even hours before this attack, you know, it seems like this this was well flagged by the Iranians. Um, you know, largely speaking, there were no fatalities, um, and it seems like there's ways for both sides to claim a success. Um, what would actually prompt some sort of retaliation from the Israelis now? Uh, well, I'm not entirely sure that this is a success for Iran. I mean, they launched a massive salvo and did essentially no damage. Right. And not only that, but one of the reasons why Iran's uh, barrage did no damage was because uh, states throughout the entire Middle East came together on behalf of Israel. And they put aside their anger with Israel over its conduct in Gaza um, because they all fear Iran more than they are frustrated with that. So Iran does not come out of this ahead, but it does feel as though it can maybe cut its losses and, and, and go on. So uh, I think that... Um, uh, I think that both states can sort of call it quits if they want. That said, Israel is very concerned that if it permits uh, a massive attack on its own soil to go um, unavenged, that this could degrade its deterrent uh, in the longer term. So, Professor Pratt, uh, you know, Israel is still in Gaza. We still have the Houthis and uh, the sea uh, around the Arabian Peninsula uh, attacking ships. I, I would I would think this current uh, bombardment by Iran of Israel is the is the latest chapter in a longer story. How do you see the rest of the story unfolding? 
Of course, the Israel-Palestine conflict is deeply and extensively intertwined with what happens in the rest of the region. But I would say that, you know, part of the, part of the story here is the long-term involvement of Russia and, and Iran in Syria. It's uh, part of Iran's larger regional strategy. I mean, the, the, uh, the IRGC general killed in Damascus in the Israeli strike was there um, because Iran is involved in Syria's civil war. Right. And, and so I don't think that a resolution of the conflict in Gaza would necessarily lead to an end uh, to the violence or the threat of violence elsewhere. Uh, but of course, it's intertwined. And the more that Israel fights in Gaza, the more that the Palestinians face um, significant humanitarian crisis or mass death, the more uh, tense Israel's relations will be with its Arab allies. Uh, which are beholden to their own publics, and the more Iran will feel anxious to defend its interests in Palestine, which are both moral and sort of geopolitical. It, it seems like when it comes to, you mentioned what allies could do. Uh, do you think the U.S. can restrain any sort of Israeli reaction in, in all of this? Obviously, they've been, I guess, a little bit more... Uh, you could say have a bit more scorn when it comes to how you know, their, you know Israel Israel's conduct in Gaza, for example. We've seen a little bit more renewed support over the weekend. Can the U.S. actually restrain Israel at this point? I believe that the U.S. has already restrained Israel. I understand, based on Israeli media sources, that there was some talk uh, of a retaliation, and that after a phone call between Biden and Netanyahu, that re that retaliation was uh, called off. I also think that the U.S. has more leverage here than it does over Israel's conduct in Gaza, because Israel's missile defense, Israel's broader geopolitical capacities depend very heavily on American uh, and allied operational support, intelligence support, logistical support, so much more so than whatever Israel does in the occupied Palestinian territories, uh, the U.S. gets a say. And if Israel is going to retaliate against Iran, it looks like it's going to do it alone and maybe weather some of those consequences alone as well. So I think that the U.S. actually has has a, a role to play here and can definitely uh, keep the leash on any kind of uh, uh, prospective Israeli military response. Simon, does, does China have any role in this? I'm just wondering, it, it seems like we've seen relations between China and Iran get closer of late, maybe given the fact that they do have a common foe which is the U.S., and they're both facing restrictions uh, from the West. How, where do you see this alliance going? Uh, so China's response has been very careful, right? Unlike uh, many other states, they haven't gone so far as to broadly condemn, as far as I know, Iran's launch. Uh, they've sort of both sides that said they, they would like for things to de-escalate and for stability to be restored. And they've redirected attention at the need for a two-state solution. And so this shows that China is anxious to portray these hostilities between Iran and Israel not as any kind of result of Iran's broader uh, regional strategy, um, but as a result of Israeli actions vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinians. And this is, of course, because Iran and China are close. Their interests are aligned in many cases. I don't know if I'd call them allies yet, but um, it serves Chinese interests as well for Iran and Russia and Assad and the Iranian sort of constellation of proxies to, to uh, uh, escape broad international censure and for Iran not to be singularly blamed for whatever's happening. Yeah. So China is just soft-touching sure. it, I think. Simon, we've got to leave it there. Simon Frankel Pratt there, lecturer of political science at the University of Melbourne. As our markets are reacting to, of course, Iran's strike on Israel, let's bring in now our Bloomberg MY strategist, Mark Cranfield. He's joining us uh, with the latest. You know, Mark, you know, I'm seeing there's, there's a bit of the dollar, not so much in the yen. Some of the havens are a bit up. But, but it seems like, at, for the most part, markets are actually seeing through some of these geopolitical risks this morning. Is that likely to last? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a reminder that uh, pricing in geopolitics has, has not been something that investors really want to do for several years. It's nothing, there's nothing new in that regard. Going back for more than a decade, people haven't been rewarded for pricing in too much 
in terms of geopolitical disruption to financial markets. So even though this appears to be a very large event, you can see already people are dialing back expectations of what it means to financial markets. There's going to be uncertainty probably for several days. There'll be nervousness, particularly every time a headline hits the wires, whether it comes from Israel or Iran or from somewhere else. That probably means that US Treasuries retain a bit of a bid, uh, at least until the next inflationary data comes along from the US. And the US dollar probably remains firm anyway. But those, those are pretty much themes which were playing out anyway, especially the US dollar has been on a very strong path for, for some time. In terms of elsewhere, gold has already been doing extremely well. And as you noted earlier, Goldman Sachs have got a very high forecast now for the, for the metal. There's something else going on there in the whole metals complex with the restrictions on Russia as well. So probably gold will continue to outperform yeah. as well. But in terms of wanting to calm down, markets are probably pretty eager to suggest that the, the worst may be over and they would really like to just get back to focusing on economic data and the other central bank issues which are coming up in the days ahead. All right, Mark, we'll talk more about China. We have time, but uh, that's all the time we have for now. Mark Cranfield there joining us from our MLive team as well. We're also counting down the open of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong this morning. Of course, uh, you know, Mark's actually been flagging on the blog about Chinese stocks for a rough week ahead, especially after that miss in the trade data from China on Friday. We have GDP numbers and a data dump in store, too. This is The China Show. Good morning. All right, we're just a few minutes away to set uh, the PBOC is set to release its one-year MLF rate in pretty soon. For more, let's bring in our Chinese uh, economy editor. I believe that's what her title still is, but she's been changing a lot of roles recently. Jill Deesis is here with us. Okay, so no change expected, but I mean, last week the data certainly was a bit of a disappointment too. Yeah, that export data was pretty concerning last week. I think at this point, though, what policymakers, as we'll find out in just a, a, about a minute from now, is um, that they're, they're still concerned about the any downward pressure on the UN in particular in that exchange rate. Um, we've seen the currency drop over the last uh, couple of months. Um, there's some concerns about whether if they cut policy rates right now, whether that continues to exacerbate that issue. I think the other uh, issue that um, the PBOC has to contend with is the fact that uh, it looks now like the Fed is going to be keeping rates a bit higher for longer. Um, we've seen some really, really strong economic data out of the U.S. Um, and creating, you know, sort of that, um, you know, that continued dis policy disparity uh, between the world's two largest economies, I think, creates some additional considerations for the PBOC to consider as they um, try to figure out whether or not uh, they need to continue easing policy. And they're a bit constrained, right, just given how weak the currency is, we're, def we're, we're still in deflation in some ways for them to actually cut rates further. Yes, exactly. I mean, look, I think uh, at this point, um, several economists think that they will uh, cut the rate on the medium-term lending facility at some point later this year. Um, Bloomberg Economics thinks maybe about 30 basis points worth of cuts uh, by the end of the year. Um, but yes, yeah, I think that the tactic, the strategy here is that it's very difficult um, for them uh, to be really aggressive with that policy this, this early. How closely do you think the PBOC is keeping its eye on the Fed and what they do in the United States? Yeah, definitely, John. I mean, they're absolutely paying attention to what the Fed is doing. And I think that that has to play into the calculus uh, that they're making as well. I mean, at this point, when we've been putting off um, expectations for a, um, you know, for, for a rate cut by the Fed, um, you know, uh, we originally a few months ago thought maybe March, now June, maybe now maybe even later into the year. I think that that all, you know, kind of plays into uh, these decisions here. All right. So we have uh, as expected, unchanged that MLF uh, one-year rate at two and a half percent. They're also conducting, yeah, 100 billion yuan or so in that MLF. So certainly, you know, things have largely panned out the way that we expected. This week, though, I mean, it's going to be a lot. I mean, given just the weakness in the export data and the like, should we dial back some of our expectations of how strong that GDP print is going to be for the first quarter? Yeah, I think we need to be fairly measured with what we're expecting here. Now, again, that export drop was pretty concerning for March because we had seen data for January and February that was incredibly strong. And so there's been this belief, and I think it still largely holds up, that the, eco the economic recovery right now is kind of of two tracks. You're seeing some really strong 
strong um, or, you know, still like fairly decent foreign demand, um, which is what we saw drive those export figures at the beginning of the year. Uh, you also had, um, you know, some really strong, um, you know, factory survey data suggesting that at least on the industrial side, China's been doing okay, but there's still those continued issues with domestic demand consumption we're experiencing. I think at this point, um, you know, broad expectations for this economic data tomorrow that retail sales are going, the growth is going to be a bit weaker than we've seen recently. I think, you know, all of this kind of adds to this picture of uh, the Chinese consumer is still very much not incredibly confident in the state of the economy. The property crisis continues to be, um, you know, this major drag on economic activity, and we're not necessarily seeing a, a major improvement there. Yeah, and John, maybe you could chime in here. I mean, the fact that they were refraining from that net cash injection for a second month as well, what, what is the policy direction going to be moving forward here? You talked about how we're getting close to some key meetings as well in the next few weeks. Well, the PBOC is not a politically independent body. We have the Politburo meeting at the end of this month uh, to, to map out the direction of economic policy. That is the group, Xi Jinping and Li Chang and the sort. They will make the decisions about the economic policy for, for China, not the PBOC. I think it's notable to, to say that all these reasons we're giving for why the PBOC would not cut rates uh, this month, uh, none of those are because the economy does not need it. The economy really needs it. I think that's very clear from the data. There are other considerations, the currency, politics, uh, debt. And I, I think that's been acting as a real restraint on what the PBOC has done and potentially will do. All right. John, Jill, thank you so much. Uh, Jill, our news desk editor, I want to say, uh, joining us here on the back of this MLF. Again, no change. Also, refraining from that net cash injection for a second month for the PBOC here as well. You take a look at the pre-markets here in Hong Kong. That's opening up here pretty soon. We talked about the CSI 300 down for a seventh day. We'll see if we get day eight here as well. But we're focusing very much. It seems like right now, given these Middle East tensions, stocks are where things are maybe being expressed. There is a bit of risk off moves in equities here this morning. The Hang saying, there you go. We're down close to one and a half percent. This is Bloomberg. Pre-market is looking like this. It might be a pretty volatile day here today in Hong Kong, especially take a look at how the pre-market is set up. HS Tech is down some 2%. We're seeing 1% declines across the board this morning. Analyst actions to tell you about. There's been one on Ag Bank in particular. That I believe that's the one from DBS Bank. H shares cut to a hold there. Net ease remove a top pick at Morgan Stanley and Xpeng. The EV sector, also some ratings from Macquarie there this morning. In terms of stocks to watch, we're focusing very much on the miners here, whether it's gold, briefly touching 2400 You have the sanctions from the U.S. US and UK on Russian metal. So you're seeing the likes of the, the Rusol down some 2%. Jiaojing Mining also down some 8% here this morning. The open is next. This is Bloomberg. We talked about how busy it's going to be. Well, we'll continue to see that downside when it comes to equities here this morning on the back of what we've been hearing with this Iran attack on Israel over the weekend. You're seeing that being felt across stocks. Not so much when it comes to oil markets. Perhaps it's been partly priced in, but you're catching a bit of a bid, haven bid into the dollar here this morning. Gold, although those two both have retreated a little bit in the Asia session. So markets still, I guess you could see, willing to see through some of these geopolitical risks here this morning, but certainly in, in Hong Kong and China. China here today. There's a lot on tap, not to mention the markets are first to digest a little bit more of the export and import data that we got on Friday late afternoon, which was a bit of a disappointment here. Some key questions of whether exports can be that pillar of growth this year. We got first quarter GDP data dump this week as well. So there's still a lot in store today. We also had that state council meeting talking about vowing to intensify a little bit on market supervision. That certainly sent some of the NASDAQ gold and dragon stocks lower on Friday as well. You're seeing a little bit of that here today. Take a look at how the Hang Seng is doing, though. Seems like that's where we're seeing most of these risk-off moves. Hang Seng, MSCI, China, both lower by about 1%. The CSI 300 is actually staying positive here, marginally speaking. We talked about we saw seven days of losses uh, on track 
Well, we could be. Well, we're already on the longest losing streak since 2020. So HS Tech seems to be what's dragging things here this morning. That's certainly where we saw most of the sell-off in the ADRs on Friday. You're seeing when it comes to some of these commodities. So Shanghai crude is actually down, which is quite surprising just given what we've been hearing in the Middle East. Uh, we're watching iron ore. That's up still 1.2%. Uh, if you flip the boards and you take a look at some movers, China Wonka, that certainly is one here today. They've been talking about addressing the liquidity pressure. They denying that there was this travel ban as well. The stock just slightly lower. But we've heard also High Tung and Citic Securities have been being probed by regulators for alleged law violations. That's why you're seeing those two brokerages down this morning. CATL, though, seems to be a standout here today. Earnings out today. Take a look at when it comes to some of the tech plays, because that certainly is how things were, were, were really badly hurt on Friday. Looks like we're continuing that on. The EV sector in particular is where we saw things sell off the most uh, when it comes to those ADRs, and you're seeing that with Xpeng as well as Neo. Macquarie also coming out with a note, talking a little bit more about the ratings around these EV stocks as well. Uh, we talked about that MLF, no change there, which was no surprise, but a second straight month we have seen uh, no net cash injection as well. And you take a look at how these miners are doing. Dowaging mining, it, it, yes, there's, but it's a little to do with the, the gold price, but also they have a share pl placement. That's why we're seeing shares down some 10%. But everything from oil to gold miners, to uh, defense stocks, which are catching a slight bid here today, to some of the aviation stocks we're watching, kind of sort of the fallout from this Iran attack on Israel as well. Not seeing a huge move, as you can see here this morning. But we also talk about the Apple story, right? Apple suppliers have been falling here in the region on the back of some data that iPhone shipments plunged 10% as well. Um, so a lot on tap. Let's bring in Steve Fu, China Portfolio Strategist at Goldman Sachs. She joins me here in our Hong Kong studios. Steve, it's great to have you. So you have a new report out. You're talking about whether to chase or fade this rally. And you're saying to stay engaged. Why? Yeah. Uh, if we look at the recent market performance uh, since the 12th in uh, late January, the market had rebound 13%. We have seen a few drivers. One is the national team buying, which kind of provided the downside support to the market, which boosts the in investor sentiment. The other thing is if we look at the macro data, the uh, first quarter macro data, actually support uh, some positive views because it's beat expectation. So uh, overall, we do see some improvements. Uh, we see a more balanced uh, pr risk and reward profile for Chinese equities. On the positive side, we, we see valuation remains quite attractive. Investor positioning remains quite low. And on the other hand, uh, we see for the company fundamentals, the earnings delivery is still quite strong. If we look at the uh, just finished the reporting numbers for 2023, MSCI China still managed to deliver 11% earnings growth, which is a decent number in line with our expectation. So overall, we see some positive things on property, also for the secondary market. We see some early signs of stabilization, especially volume picked up for some selective cities. You still think, though, earnings, maybe the market is still a bit too optimistic about mm -hmm. ASP. I mean, just given the deflationary pressures out there. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think they're missing the most? And what are your projections now for the year? Yeah, uh, for the 2024, what I just mentioned is for 2003, yeah. uh, MSCI China is in line with the expectation. But for 2024, the consensus forecast for MSCI China is 13% earnings growth. Our forecast is 8%. Uh, actually, it's quite broad based. For most of the sectors, consensus are above our forecast. Uh, it is a common phenomenon that for in the past 10 years, eight of them, uh, sell side consensus begin with a higher number than the actual realized number. So this is not something new. Uh, but w what we think is the, as you mentioned, overcapacity issue and the inflation pressure, which may put more pressure on margins. So that's why we think we need to remain selective for different sectors, especially when considering the margin difference. Sifu, we just had Janet Yellen visit Beijing. Uh, she talked a lot about overcapacity. You just mentioned overcapacity. We, we have the German Chancellor visiting China this week. We are expecting him to also bring up the issue of overcapacity. How do you see that affecting earnings going forward? 
Yeah, uh, the overcapacity issue actually is more significant for some like tech hardware sector, clean energy sector. Uh, so this is an important issue that we think investors may consider, continue considering the margin pressure for these selective uh, sectors. So what we suggest investors to do is we think for the services sector, which are more resilient. And if we look at the margin performance, uh, actually for these services sector, Sectors, the margin are more robust and stable. While for tradable goods, the margin are suffer from higher pressure. Uh, so that's why we think uh, so far we still overweight internet sector, which are consumer related sectors. We think this is one of the reasons that given the deflationary concerns, we think the services sectors may perform better than tradable goods sectors. What gives you optimism about consumer spending, especially on services going forward in China, given, given the weak state of so much of the economy, the property sector, for example? Uh, why, why, are you so, why are you bullish on uh, the Internet sector? Yeah, uh, first, if we look at the internet sector for the coming and uh, just past earnings season, uh, for the earnings they delivered, uh, they st most of the internet se sectors in aggregate is still disclose, uh, disc uh, disc uh, delivered 30 to 50% earnings growth. Uh, and uh, we think it shows some robustness there. Uh, the other thing is uh, we see they have better capex and the cost control. Uh, that means for these sectors, they can maintain their margin. So that's why we think for these sectors, uh, they are performing better f considering the deflationary pressure. Uh, as I, I also agree with you that property slowdown down may still put pressure on consumption in general. But what we want to say is for services sector, actually if we look at the January, February data, uh, consumption is actually beat expectation. Uh, most investors ha have already priced in some negative impact from property slow down, but so far the real life number kind of beat the low expectation. So this is also a marginal improvement as we see. Um, tell us a little more about your targets now. I mean, how much more upside are you expecting? And it seems like you're changing your preference between A and H for the next few months or so. Why? Yes. Uh, if we look at the 12 months index target, we focus 60 for MSCI China and uh, 3,900 for CSI 300. We uh, didn't change our index view for 12 months uh, that we remain overweight China A because uh, policy may still benefit them. But we change our three months more technical view to favoring H shares more because of the earnings downside for offshore stocks uh, is small. And another factor we think we need to consider is a potential U.S. Uh, Fed risk cut. Uh, although our U.S. economy is pushed back uh, our uh, first cut date uh, from June to July, mm -hmm. uh, but if it comes from the liquidity perspective, it may benefit offshore stocks more. So that is something we suggest investors to look at. All right. Sifu, it's great to have you. China portfolio strategist at Goldman Sachs this morning. Uh, as we look at what, what really are some risk off moves when it comes to stocks here this morning, take a look at how some of these safe havens, some of these risk assets are looking like here today. So you're not seeing a, a big flight to safety into gold. In fact, we briefly touched 2400. We're slightly on the back foot now, just at 2373. VIX is, is actually in the red. Dollar yen still at 153. So it's not really that really haven play this morning. And But you are seeing a little bit of bid into treasuries with the U.S. 10-year yield actually were up one basis points uh, on the curve, 4.53 this morning. But really what the moves have been in the dollar, a little bit when it comes to oil markets, but not quite. You take a look at how you know, U.S. futures are, the fact that they're punching positive is a good indication here that maybe you know, some of these risk-off moves might not last too long. Brent's actually just holding around 90 and WTI slightly in the back foot here at 85 bucks. So still looking pretty steady this morning. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, we're checking one developer in particular, or at least one conglomerate here today, Chattawanka, saying that it's making plans to resolve liquidity pressure and short-term operational difficulties. It's also told Wall Street brokerages that its executives remain free to travel abroad, seeking to ease concern about its ability to stave off a default. Now, joining us now is our bond and loan reporter, Loretta Chen. 
Yeah. What, what war did we hear from in the statement, Loretta? So that statement came over the weekend. Van Ki, the previous week, was really embroiled in a lot of troubles. There were uh, the S&P downgrade, which makes the company become a junk-rated bond, a junk-rated company among all three rating agencies. It's facing rumors about some of its executives in uh, this province, Shandong. Um, people were saying that some of its, its executives were grounded for uh, being banned from traveling abroad. So there's a lot of speculation around the company, and we saw some market weakness uh, um, over the past week. And now Vanke is saying, admitting essentially that it's got liquidity trouble and near-term business operations faces its challenges. And it's saying it's going to deploy some internal resources to solve this problem before resorting to uh, maybe government help. Uh, hey, Loretta, how likely does it look like Vanke will get through this liquidity challenge? Yeah, well, it seems like now it largely depends on the kind of uh, liquidity pool Van Key can tap from the banks um, because it's such a big scale developer and we know that home sale has been slumping across the board for all these Chinese developers, including Van Key. So over the past uh, quarter in 2024, actually state-owned developers saw their sales dropping almost 50%, and that's in line with the 60% year-on-year drop for private companies. So that gap is really narrowing. So Vanky faces all sorts of challenges uh, on the operational front, on its business front. So the only viable financing channel that we believe Vanky can tap right now is from the government. It's got the almost 30% stake uh, in Vanky from the Shenzhen government. And we're looking to hear more from uh, you know its backers what kind of financing plan they're going to uh, provide for Vanky. And what is this latest situation with, with, with Vanky actually going to tell us about the overall real estate sector now. Well, the overall real estate is still finding a bottom, as we can tell. Uh, you know, home sales continue to drop, and we haven't really seen how that situation is going to resolve. There's been rate cuts, there's been lowering the mortgage payments, there's been loosening of home buying restrictions. That has so far failed to help the real estate market. And I think Vanky will tell you just how far that confident crisis in China's uh, home market has gone, and it's going to further, um, I think, hurt uh, home buyer confidence. Loretta, thank you, Loretta Chen there, our bond and loan reporter on the latest when it comes to China, Vanky. And you're seeing the stock actually slightly up this morning on the back of some of these comments from the developer as well. Let's take a look when it comes to the metal space, because certainly we're seeing quite a bit of a hit here this morning. So aluminum and nickel are actually surging on the London Metal Exchange as new U.S. and U.K. sanctions on Russian supplies kick in. Let's bring in Martin Ritchie, our commodities reporter who joins us now. Um, you know, were we expecting these sort of, I mean, the fact that we're seeing basically they're they're going to stop, at least the LME is basically following through what we heard from the U.S. and U.K., but it's only after for metals that are produced before Friday, right, or after Friday. I'm just wondering what impact do you think this is going to really have on the supply issue, Martin? Yeah, uh, so we were expecting some fireworks uh, this morning when trading opened, and, and we did get it. Uh, so aluminum surged by more than 9%. That's actually the most since the modern contract was begun trading in 1987. So uh, given that this is a metal that's been through a lot of different uh, geopolitical turmoil, it's, this is a big moment. Um, what, what, what the US and UK said late on, on Friday night uh, was that metal, that's copper, aluminum and nickel, produced after midnight last Friday in Russia uh, cannot now be supplied to the London Metal Exchange. So that means it can't be delivered into the global network of, of warehouses. Um, now, so that means the, the price gains are simply fueled by this, this idea that, you know, the world's going to be a little bit shorter of aluminum, um, it, it, perhaps in the longer term. Uh, in, the, in, in, in that longer term also, I think we can expect uh, more Russian supplies to go to China. Um, last year, Rusal, the biggest uh, Russian aluminum producer, sent almost a quarter or got almost a quarter of its revenues from selling to China. That was up by quite a large margin. Um, but there's also a lot of uncertainty around this because there is actually still a lot of Russian supply uh, hanging around in the London Metal Exchange warehouse system. Um, so the question is, what happens to that? Do people do, do people ignore it, or does it fetch a, a much lower price, the stuff that was produced before midnight last Friday? 
Hey, Martin. So theoretically, let's say China gets a lot more supply of cheap uh, Russian metal. Is that going to be good for Chinese markets, for Chinese metals prices? Um, we, that, that touches on a, on, a, on a quite sensitive question. Now, um, there's a kind of logic, obviously, to sending uh, Russian material to, to China. Uh, at perhaps uh, they could perhaps get a discount. Um, but at the same time, you know, China has its own very large um, uh, aluminum producers who perhaps don't want uh, a big flood of uh, Russian material coming in. If you look at last year, that kind of big surge in Russian supply, it came at a time when uh, China's aluminum supply was actually fairly short. So it was good for the Chinese market at that time. Um, it's not inevitably going to be the case that you know that this this stuff this material is going to be welcomed uh, in in China. So we'll have to see uh, uh, where that happens. If there is some supply tightness uh, in China, then yeah, the traders in China will pounce on that Russian material. All right, Martin. Thank you, Martin Ritchie. There are Kamali's reporter joining us out of Shanghai. You take a look at how some of these benchmarks are doing, and you're certainly seeing Hong Kong uh, feel it here this morning in terms of these risk aversion. We're falling some 2% or so uh, when it comes to HS Tech. Hang Seng's down about 1.5% here. It's surprising that you're seeing the onshore markets at least recovering after seven days of losses. So we're above water there by about a fifth of 1%. In terms of uh, the impact you know, on the Middle East and this Iran attack on Israel over the weekend, we're just taking a look at some of these crude contracts and we're actually seeing oil prices ease off on some of the speculation that uh, on this conflict and possibly the fact that this was well telegraphed well in advance that Iran basically said this is a sort of one and done sort of tact that you know so far the risks remain contained this morning plenty more ahead this is Bloomberg Well, it's time for your China Brief, a look at some of the stories making headlines in Chinese media. Great time to really get John Liu on, on the show here today. You're looking through some of these local papers. How are they, in particular, when it comes to the top story for us today, how are they covering these attacks on Israel? Well, it's been relatively muted, Yvonne. So here we have the Global Times, and you'll see uh, the headline here in Chinese is just that uh, the Iranian attacks on Israel have uh, affected the world. Uh, I, I would note, though, in this Chinese headline, there's a little, little subhead over here that says, uh, that describes the American response as being extremely subtle. And so th still taking hmm. some opportunities to uh, get the Chinese side of the story in there. Yeah, interesting. Um, there's also, just the timing of, of the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, is heading over to where you are for a, a three-day visit. I mean, how are people, how is that being covered in, in terms of what to expect? Uh, so he's on the front page as well, but just sort of on the side here, uh, on the back, uh, you'll see here's a picture of Mr. Schultz. Uh, the, the, what the Chinese papers are saying is they are emphasizing that this is an economic visit. Uh, they are saying, for example, in the Global Times here, that he's going to be in Shanghai and Chongqing and then in Beijing. So they're saying two days of economics, one day of politics. So the focus on getting the trade relationship <laughs> right. Yeah, and you got to wonder, I'm, I'm guessing EVs are going to make it part of that conversation, maybe, if we get any sort of details yes. there. Um, there's an interesting thing from that state council meeting, or at least a statement that came out about stock market supervision. What can we glean from, from that statement? So we have gotten uh, all the business newspapers are, are featuring uh, the state council and what they put out uh, uh, late on Friday. Uh, they are referring to it as sort of one plus n. It's just a reference to uh, what the state council did and then what the CSRC and various other entities in China did, the stock exchanges. Uh, they are also making the point that IPOs, IPOs are a front line, mm. tightening, strengthening regulation on IPOs. They are calling a front line to supporting the market. And they are also, uh, for example, in the Shanghai Securities News today, there's a little article on the front page here saying that the economic situation in the first quarter is getting the year off to a good start. Whether or not that is true, we will find out tomorrow, obviously, when we get mm. GDP and lots of other data. All right. Thank you. That was a, that was a great sort of brief on, on everything. It was great to have that, that show intel today. John, thanks so much. And thanks for joining me at this hour as well. I just want to recast some of the day that we saw over the weekend. Of course, we were talking to Jill Deeses about this a little bit earlier. So the disappointment in the trade data, credit data as well, with aggregate financing 
up, well, about 8.7% year to date. So certainly that's going to be through that discussion what those first quarter GDP numbers are going, really going to look like for this for China. I mean, Goldman Sachs certainly has been, been a bit more optimistic when they boosted their 2024 uh, forecast here uh, to, to, I think, around 4, 5%, I believe, yes. And you talk about what's in store. I mean, it's, it's everything beyond just the GDP numbers that we're looking at. So the, the estimates were 4.8 for the first quarter. We also have industrial production, retail sales, and fixed asset investment that is going to be on tap. So certainly, we're, we're looking for more clues on whether this momentum can sustain in the data and what the second quarter is really going to hold as well. We talked about that MLF in just the last couple of minutes there, unchanged from the PBOC here today. Take a look at the markets across the board. Your GMM function is looking like this here today. So stocks are certainly seeing a bit of red here this morning, certainly given some of the, the geopolitical risks around Iran and the Middle East here. You're seeing a little bit of that uh, in, in the dollar. So for the most part, most Asia FX is selling off here this morning or weakening. Commodities, we continue to talk about those sanctions when it comes to Russian metal. So that's why you're seeing Shanghai futures of aluminum are surging about 1% here. But it's really the LME contracts where we're seeing a lot of that price action and volatility. And there is a little bit of flight to safety into some of these sovereign bonds here this morning. Mind you, the 10-year yield is actually stabilized and yields are ticking up now, but we're seeing that follow through when it comes to Asia fixed income here this morning. Gold also briefly touching that 2400. We're talking about new productive forces coming up in the next hour. This is Bloomberg. Surveillance covers the latest in global markets and the political events that influence your world. Join Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne Marie Hordern only on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Financial world on demand. Hear from leading economists, policymakers, and industry experts via live and on demand webinars only from Bloomberg. Start exploring to see what's moving the markets. Visit Bloomberg.com webinars. The annual prize money pool in LPGA tournaments has grown 50% since 2019. In 2023, it topped $100 million. But the prize fund still lags far behind what men compete for on the... Welcome back to the China Show. You're looking at live pictures out of Tel Aviv, and that's really uh, what we're really focusing on here this morning is whether we will see any sort of response from the Israeli government after those Iran attacks over the weekend. So far, we've seen a bit more diplomacy leading up to these attacks as well. So certainly the market seems to be taking it in stride. At least if you look at Brent markets, it, we're pretty much flat when it comes to Brent and still holding around that $90 level here. The rest of the markets, though, you are seeing a few risk-off moves when it comes to equities in particular, uh, but that flight to safety you, you initially saw when it comes to the dollar, when it comes to gold, that's slowly kind of backtracking a little bit here this morning as well. In fact, the CSI 300, there you go, we're now up some nine-tenths of one percent, so snapping out of seven days of losses and getting out of what has been the longest losing streak in four years. So at least we're seeing some upside when it comes to onshore. Hong Kong is another story here this morning, but you take a look at how some of these havens have performed, and you're not really seeing that typical sort of flow into dollar yen in particular. I mean, it's still holding around 153 and still weakening here in the Asia session. So not quite when it comes to the yen, but gold as well. But we briefly touched 2400. U.S. Treasuries as well. We're actually seeing yields tick a little bit higher in the Asia session. We're at 453 this morning as well. I want to bring in 
uh, now our chief of Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, who's going to be my anchor buddy here for the next hour. Um, certainly, you know, what you've been talking about the China response to these Iranian attacks. We have an Olaf Scholz visit in Beijing, which is quite timely as well. What's going to be top of mind for you? Yeah, I think that, and also just a uh, follow up on the MLF as well that yeah. you guys talked about with John. You know, this is an economy that desperately needs stimulus. Uh, but again, there's other concerns and probably why they held off uh, keeping uh, that one year MLF uh, unchanged. Uh, essentially, the yuan is a, is a big issue there. And of course, Olaf Scholz is in town or he's in going to Shanghai today. He was in Chongqing. He arrived there, I believe, yesterday. Uh, he went to a Bosch factory. Uh, he is also, he has to listen to the concerns of the German businesses. Uh, two out of three in a German chamber of commerce of China, a survey saying, look, they're facing unfair competition in the China market. So there are these concerns. And this is at a time as well where other EU leaders are discussing and really threatening the potential for tariffs on EVs and the like. So he's going to have to really walk a very, uh, you know, tricky balancing act uh, as far as making sure that German interests are, of course, uh, you know, acknowledged and trade with China, the biggest trading partner of Germany, uh, has to be maintained and grown mm -hmm. while at the same time not undermining what some of those EU leaders are saying. All right. Steve, hang tight. You're going to stick with me for the next few minutes or so this hour. I want to bring in Garfield Reynolds, who leads our Markets Live Asia coverage and joins us now. Garfield, I mean, we mentioned in the break just now that it's not like what well, the moves in the price action we're seeing is not nothing, right? I mean, what do you think is going to, where we're going to see the most impact so far on these Middle East tensions? Well, I mean, the, there's been a strong impact on, on equities, you know, obviously, uh, even acknowledging that Asian equities have consolidated, you know, they, they sort of matched more or less the sell-off that we saw from the U.S. at the end of last week and then you, you know, came back up a, a little bit. But it still adds to you know, what's a bit of a wall of woe for stocks. You know, if you look I was looking before, over the last five days or so, the topics, for example, is an outperformer because it's flat, whereas U.S. equities are down anywhere between 1% you know, and 2%, depending on which gauge you look at, over that period. Now, that period includes a big drop on Friday, but equities had definitely been showing some concerns about being overstretched. And in a lot of ways, the expectation coming into this week or you know, before Friday had been that equities would be looking to the U.S. earnings season, hoping that that would show enough resilience there in corporate earnings and especially in guidance for you know, the coming months, that that would allow equities to keep marching higher despite the jump in yields that had set up a difficult backdrop. Now, yields have come back down because of the haven concerns that broke out on Friday, but that doesn't necessarily set up uh, you know, a, 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 an easier situation for stocks because you know, yields are down because people are worried, and there is still plenty of worry about exactly how this Middle East scenario will play out. Yeah, you've been writing on the blog about what we're seeing in, in precious metals. I mean, gold and silver has had a stunning rally this year. We're actually seeing gold prices heading lower here. What, what do you make of these sort of fluctuations? Well, I, I mean, gold and silver uh, is very interesting. You know, they, they're often being seen as haven you know, sort of assets because you know, they're not fiat currencies. You're talking about something physical and also something that retains its value because it doesn't tarnish. But they dropped a lot on Friday. That is an acknowledgment of the idea that there is some speculative froth in those prices. That being said, they also they've bounced back better than equities have today. That's because there are other factors that are seen guiding them high, higher. And gold in particular, I think it's been very interesting the way gold has been so strong this year. That speaks to a lot of those ongoing concerns about the sustainability of equities, what's going to be the wash up from the US you know, election season. We've got both sides of politics there looking to increase spending. We've got inflation concerns. We've also got the potential for very strong you know, Fed action at some stage. If they do cut, they might cut rapidly. So all of that has people looking for 
gold and silver as a potential diversification, as a potential hedge against a range of risks. And I think you, right now your big question as an investor is how can I hedge all these risks other than simply expecting yeah. the U.S. dollar to keep climbing? Yeah, and, and you're not seeing it in, in yen, right? If I look at 153 handle for dollar yen right now. It's it really it's as diminished as a, as a haven currency of late. Are we likely to get you know any concern from some of these Japanese officials of where these levels are right now? Well, the difficulty for Japanese officials right now is you know they 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 probably do want to intervene at some stage, but how do they intervene in this? You know, they're not getting the opening. To, to be able to do anything more than spend a bunch of their foreign currency reserves and then see the yen you know, drop back, uh, you know, the dollar yen rate climb back up soon after because the basics are still overwhelmingly in favor of the US dollar. They really need either some stronger policy signals from the BOJ or they need to see US data take a step down and open the potential for the Fed to actually cut rates at some stage this year. That would bring some of the heat out of the dollar gains and would give them an opening. As it is now, all they can really do is, is jawbone and, and hope that the market doesn't collapse in a way that would force their hand. You know, if the yen was to pop by mm -hmm. Yen was to drop by one percent or more in a day, or was to actually approach 155 at a rapid pace. Those are the sort of things that might you know, see them actually intervene, almost against their own wishes to do so. Garfield, thank you, Garfield Reynolds, there, who leads our MLF team uh, in Singapore for us here this morning. You take a look when it comes to some of these China benchmarks, and we talked about the outperformance that you're seeing in the CSI 300. So, you know, after seven days of losses, we're actually seeing gains of more than one and a half percent in Shanghai this morning. But you take a look at how the rest of offshore markets are doing. We've come off some of the lows, but Hang Seng is still down about close to one percent. HS Tech seems to be that big drag here this morning. We're down more than one and a half percent in terms of the FX side of things. As as Garfield mentioned. You know, it's really hard to try to bring anything to drag down this dollar here right now. You're seeing that across most Asia FX. We talked about dollar yen, 725.81. We're still seeing some strength come through in that currency in the renminbi at least today, but we're still seeing a mixed bag. But the dollar taking a little bit of a back foot here in the last few hours or so. Coming up, we're going to talk about China's push to unleash these so-called new productive forces and why it's not going down well with everyone. We have a panel coming up next. This is Bloomberg. We're awaiting that big data dump on Tuesday out of China, including first quarter GDP numbers, as well as last month's activity data. So everything from industrial production and retail sales. And it really comes as Beijing trumpets this new slogan, right? One that favors the emerging economy over the traditional. It's a bid to boost fresh drivers of growth as a debt-laden property market drags on the economy. <laughs> Major tasks for 2024. The CPC Central Committee has adopted overall guidelines for this year's work. We must fully carry them out, stay focused on principal issues, and work to remove development bottlenecks. First, striving to modernize the industrial systems and develop, developing new qualities, productive forces at a faster pace. And that was from Lee Chang, of course. And it's all about those new productive forces, right? That slogan top Beijing's annual priorities list published in March during the National People's Congress. And the phrase was coined last September by President Xi Jinping, who defined it as advanced productivity that leads innovation. Chinese state media says it represents the evolution of production, specifically in sectors such as tech and innovation. And that includes everything from tourism, EVs, and renewable energy. But the new productive forces push isn't really going down well with everyone. You take a look at what the European Union is saying. They've pushed back against what it says is a glut of Chinese products flooding its market, including EVs. Meanwhile, the U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says nothing is off the table in response to China's excess manufacturing capacity. China is now simply too large for the rest of the world to absorb this enormous capacity. 
actions taken by the PRC today can shift world prices. And when the global market is flooded by artificially cheap Chinese products, the viability of American and other foreign firms is put into question. Let's bring in our guest now. We have Zhao Zhuwei. He is president and chief economist at Pinpoint Asset Management. Also with him is Hao Hong, partner and chief economist at Grow Investment Group. Also want to bring us Stephen Engel back to this discussion. I mean, I'll start with you too, gentlemen, on, on what you make of this new slogan, New Productive Forces, and do you think it's enough to revive this economy? Zhuwei, I'll start with you. All right. Uh, yeah, so I, I guess I'll take more sort of a positive uh, angle on that. Um, I have to say, I mean, I, it's not very clear to me what exactly it is, right? So, but the, the way I think about it is, uh, what is not a new productive technology? That means probably, probably it's not. Um, infrastructure, probably not. Um, EV, um, you know, new alternative energy, they, they are likely to be defined, included as, as an example of a new productive technology. Then what, what about the other manufacturing? I would say most likely the whole manufacturing sector uh, most of the manufacturing sector is probably included or encouraged by the Chinese government to um, to support growth. Um, I, I think the government uh, agenda now is really more about um, moving the resources away from things like uh, property um, and 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 to some extent infrastructure because they understand there's a huge overcapacity there. They are moving things uh, to relatively less um, overcapacity sort of sectors. I think that that's probably the angle. Uh, how? I mean, it, as, as Jue mentioned, we don't really know what it means. Yeah, nobody he, knows what it means. <laughs> <laughs> What's your interpretation then? Well, I think it's a new concept. But the, thing, the things we borrow into this new concept is more or less the same as what we've been doing for the past couple of years. EV, solar panel, all that kind of stuff, which is, as Jue said, is away from the traditional property investments. But then, you know, as the actual stuff that we've been doing within this bucket is more or less the same as last couple of years. Mm. So if they're going to be obviously taking up a lot of the growth that was going to be missing with property, property bubble has burst, obviously. Yeah. But at the provincial level, they need land sales. They, they, the, the old model has been getting revenue from property. So yeah. how does manufacturing pick up that part of the slack? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, from the fiscal perspective, um, it looks like they will have to get a lot of help from the central government, right? So they, the central government now issue more bonds. I think the debt to GDP ratio for the whole country probably will have to go up. Um, so for the next couple of years, the central government will have to pick up the slack um, and then wait for the, the property sector to gradually stabilize. Uh, I don't think the land sale revenue will be nearly as important as, as in the past. Uh, but at the same time, the central, the, the local government financing is probably going to become much, the size of it probably become much smaller, and, and most of that will be transferred to the central government. On the other side, I mean, manufacturing hopefully will absorb some of the, uh, the labor supply and uh, to uh, keep the labor market, you know, gradually improving. Uh, I think that's probably the vision that the central government has, but it will take time. And how, I mean... I think back in the day when, when the globalization was a big theme, China could have done this, right, and yeah. executed this where they could just export their way out of their problems. But now you're dealing with these geopolitical tensions in the EU as well as the U.S. as well. So, so what does this mean for industrial policy overall then? Yeah, well, I, well let me, let me try, try this first. Well, in, in the, during the years of COVID, right, so obviously uh, property starting to peak and then starting to decline. All right, so it's very obvious that you know if you put more money into property, then you know the result will be pretty bad. And then at the same time, because of the lost lost global manufacturing capacity, right? So China has been China has been manufacturing on behalf of the rest of the globe and trying to supply mm. uh, for the global demand. So I think as a result, you know, today we look back, you know, we're seeing all this excess capacity. You know, people has been, you know, criticizing China about, you know, we're having all this excess capacity because part of the capacity is not built for domestic consumption. All right, so now we're left with, you know, this excess capacity. We have to do, do something with it. So I think, you know, in, if you look at the domestic economy, right, so manufacturing sector is actually picking up the slack. Yeah. Uh, in, the, in the sense that many, uh, the value added by the, country, uh, the uh, manufacturing sector is actually greater than the traditional uh, sectors combined. 
Uh, so I think you know, there's gradually. I think internally China is working out a way. But I think globally, you know, it's perceived as an angle that you know China is having this huge capacity and you know having a, a global supply glut and is is uh, affecting other countries' benefits. Mm. So again. I was there at the National People's Congress, and I heard from all the different ministry and agency heads, and they kept on talking about new productive forces. Mm. And again, to really channel investment into the new three. Mm. Those are, of course, solar panels, new energy vehicles, and, and the like, uh, and batteries, of course, yeah. as well. Do we run the risk, if that's the marching orders coming from a top, that there is going to lead to overcapacity, overinvestment in these spaces, and that is going to distort global trade? basically picking up on the rhetoric coming from Janet Yellen and the like. Okay, well, I, w I would say that, you know, if, if you look at the past 18 months, right, the solar panel price has declined 66%, almost 70%, right? So it's, it's, it's the market telling you that there's an excess capacity in, the, in place. And also if you look at EVs, right, so now Chinese EVs cost you know, less than 70,000 yuan to buy one, right? So if you buy a Chanel handbag, it costs 90,000 <laughs> So it's, it's a thing to behold. So I would say that, you know, the market is already telling you this, you know, excess capacity. And I think one of the solutions really is to export some of that out to other countries. Now, you know, mercantilism has been, you know, one of the strategies that, you know, China has been pursuing over the past, I don't know how many years. And I wouldn't be surprised to see, you know, such strategy continue. And, but then it, it will create repercussion from foreign countries. Yeah, but you know, is that, I mean, I, I do think that will happen, but from a China's perspective, is, is that something that um, they just have to give up? I mean, I, I don't think China has a lot of options now. Uh, that's, that's the issue. I, I think, and, and also if you look at, across the manufacturing sector, it's not just EVs, it's actually a lot of other products. At first, uh, first three months of this year, the Chinese exports of sort of the conventional products actually outperformed uh, the new products that you mentioned, the EV uh, exports. And I think in, on those products like furniture, footwear, um, you know, suitcases, those exports, I, I don't see really that big a problem that you know things are, are, are you know Chinese export cheap footwears to the rest of the world yeah. in the environment where you know a lot of economy is suffering from inflation, right? So. You know, I, I think there's a lot of rhetoric on the press, but what's happening, the, the, the economic relation is not that confrontation. Actually, there's some benefit that both sides enjoy. So where do you think we are seeing overcapacity? He mentioned solar, Powell mentioned solar, yeah. EVs. I mean, where is it most pronounced, the excess capacity now? Um, actually, China, I mean, if you look at the past just 30, 40 years, that's, that's the... Uh, one feature of the Chinese economy is that they're, they're always over capacity, right? So uh, cement, um, steel, uh, steel I right. mean, everywhere, right? That's so, right. Um, University students. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we graduated at <laughs> the time. We were not that over capacity. Uh, but, uh, um, but, you know, uh, looking just from the government angle, I don't see um, that many other options uh, because. Well, Stimulating consumption is another alternative. That, that, that yeah. was what I was just going to say. Yeah. Stimulate domestic consumption. How is that going to happen? I've talked to a number of economists, including Michael Pettis up at uh, Beida, Peking University. He's like saying, look, they need to give cash handouts. Yeah. You know, it's welfareism, if you will, handouts to the households. Is that, I mean, it's not something Xi Jinping wants to do or has a track record of doing it. But what is going to stimulate the consumer and get the domestic consumption to also kind of soak up that excess capacity? Yeah, I think last year uh, in the economist circle, right, so we were talking about handing out cash to mm. uh, Chinese residents, right, and that didn't happen. Right? But I think another form of uh, fiscal expansion really is, you know, you can use the public money uh, to buy all the excess housing and then distribute it as a, a, a sort of a cheap housing, economy housing, you know, to the public. Right? So I think that's one way to, uh, to solve the housing crisis and also, you know, you know, trying to transfer physically from the public to private. And I think the second way to do it is that, you know, as we all know, China, China is facing a demographic challenge. Yeah. Right? So in many of the big cities, people stop having kids. 
Right, so then I think you know one of the ways could be that you know you can use the public money to help people raise their kids, right? So give out benefits if they have kids, free education to 18, uh, you know, free milk until you're 21. That kind of stuff. <laughs> so I think you know that way then is is one of the ways to show that you know there there are uh, caring from the top and yeah. also there's a, a transfer from public to private. Real quickly, how anyone that's watching this wants to know how to invest around this theme. How do you do so? I mean, if, if I just bought the Star 50, I probably would have been losing money right now. How do you position around this sort of new productive forces theme, if any? Yeah, uh, yeah, it's challenging, to be, to be honest. Um, I think uh, the Hong Kong market has been down for four years in a row. It's never happened in any asset class in the world. Um, I think um, right now, especially for this year, you know, things are starting to look up, right? So, for example, in the factoring sector in, in March, is slightly better than expected. Uh, you know, the housing sector somehow, you know, it's down three years now, is starting, uh, starting to stabilize as well. So I think, you know, in this part of the world, you know, the best opportunity is still in the long bond, long treasury bonds, right? So you can see Chinese treasury bonds is still, the yield is still coming down, yeah. right? So if the housing glut, housing crisis is not resolved, you can be sure that, you know, the, the long yield is continue to trend down and it's going to make all time low again and again and again. Hao Hong, thank you, John Zhiwei. Thank you so much for joining okay. us. Fantastic discussion there. Joining us from Pinpoint as well as Grow Investment Group. We got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, we're taking a look at when it comes to markets here this morning. And in terms of movers, Apple suppliers certainly much fun focus here. Take a look at that. AAC Tech and Sunny Optical down of 2%. On the back of that report, that iPhone shipments plunged 10% as you're starting to see that competition with Android heat up once again. We're watching very closely these you know, the metals in particular, the LME contracts. Take a look at Jiaojing Mining, the gold miners. That was due to a share placement with Jiaojing. But overall, those U.S. and U.K. sanctions on Russian metal, that is is hurting the likes of Rusal here this morning as well. And Japanese markets heading to that break with the Nikkei down some 1%. The state of Israel is strong. The IDF is strong. The public is strong. We appreciate the U.S. standing by Israel's side, as well as the support of Great Britain, France, and many other countries. I have set a clear principle. Whoever strikes us, we will strike him. We will defend ourselves against every threat, and we will do this calmly and with determination. From our point of view, this operation is over and there's no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. That was the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Mohammed Bagheri, the chief of staff for Iran's armed forces there. Welcome to the China Show. We're bringing you live pictures out of Tel Aviv here this morning. Of course, on just two days after that Iran attack on Israel, the first such assault that we've seen from Iranian soil against Israel for that so a sign of retaliation for that suspected Israeli strike that we saw on the consulate in Damascus just earlier this month as well that killed several Iranian commanders here. Oil markets are taking in stride. In fact, we're actually seeing Brent prices slightly lower here on this Monday morning. Perhaps this has been largely priced in, but certainly we've been talking to our oil reporters about you know the risk of maybe $100 oil if we see more of this sort of tit for tat uh, or, or at least a retaliation from the Israelis. That certainly is what we're watching on this Monday morning, uh, what form that response could take from Netanyahu's government. You take a look at how markets are taking it, though. Stocks are certainly taking a bit of a hit. We're down about eight tenths of one percent here in the region. U.S. futures, though, are actually higher. So after the sell-off that we saw on Friday, perhaps we're starting to see maybe traders are willing to kind of see through some of these geopolitical risks here as well. There was that flight into the dollar. There was that flight into treasuries. That's also in some ways coming off now. And we're seeing, though, when it comes to sector by sector, we are seeing actually most sectors in the red when it comes to the equity market here today. The standout still remains to be, of course, 
no surprise, the energy players here in the region. You take a look at how Brent contracts are looking like, though, it's still showing that weakness that we just talked about here today. So quite surprising in terms of the reaction so far. Let's bring in now Christine Burke. She is joining us from Riyadh this morning. And Christine, you know, obviously we've been tracking very closely the comments that we've heard from both sides. Tell us what the latest is. Well, good morning, Yvonne. It's good to be here with you this morning talking about what are some pretty significant developments for us here in the Middle East. The first thing that I will say is that while this attack by Iran on, on Israel had been widely telegraphed and we were expecting action heading into the weekend, the fact that it has now happened is significant for us here on the ground. Uh, this is the first time that we have seen Iran attack Israel from directly within its own soil. Uh, traditionally, Iran has long used its proxy militant groups, including Hezbollah and Hamas to carry out attacks on Israel. Uh, essentially, Iran has long operated uh, in the shadows of war rather than being directly involved. Now, with this latest attack that we saw over the weekend, Iran is signaling that it is ready to challenge Israel directly. And that means that the status of relations here in the Middle East are now in a very delicate position. Uh, and already we've seen strong international uh, reaction from the international community. G7 leaders condemned the attack on Israel, uh, but also said they stand with Israel in support of its security. They have also said that they will possibly look at the possibility of more sanctions on Iran. Uh, but at the same time, they have uh, expressed the need for all parties to exercise maximum restraint in order to prevent this from escalating into something that gets out of control. So we know where the key global players stand on this. I think the key question now becomes, uh, where does Israel stand and what is the reaction that we will see from Israel? Uh, Iran said yesterday that it would not carry out any further strikes on Israel if Israel does not retaliate aggressively. Uh, so I think we're in a little bit of a wait and see holding pattern here as we look right. to figure out uh, you know what Israel is going to do with its reaction here. Uh, Bloomberg Economics summed it up quite nicely saying Iran designed its strikes on Israel to cause maximum symbolism minimum damage by themselves. They shouldn't move markets much but if they trigger an Israeli counter response then the war in the Middle East could spiral dangerously out of control. Christine, Stephen Engel here, if I can jump in and just picking up on that possible Israeli retaliation. Uh, and you're talking about it's a wait and see. What kind of time frame are we looking at here and what type of retaliation would we likely see given the fact that uh, the, you know, the repelling of the missiles and drones was pretty successful? There was not a lot of damage or fatalities. Yeah, that is correct. And there, there are a couple of key points I'll make. The first is that really right now it's very uncertain in terms of what we are going to see going ahead. Uh, yesterday there were some Israeli officials that were out there making comments calling for Israel to respond aggressively. Uh, there were also some comments made saying that Iran did intend to inflict more damage but that it wasn't able to just given the strength of Israel's air defense systems and also that it had the help of its allies. Uh, we are also hearing from, from, from sources that G7 leaders have agreed to use all of the their channels of influence in order to persuade Israel not to take aggressive action. Uh, we have also heard from an official in the U.S. that Israel told the U.S. Uh, that it is not looking to escalate the conflict with Iran. So perhaps those are things that can be taken, uh, you know, as a positive signal. But but you have to understand definitely that Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is certainly feeling the pressure from within his government, from within hardliners in the government to respond. So really, it's too early to say as of now what we're looking for in terms of action, but certainly that is the question that we are looking to answer. And Christine, hold that thought. I'm going to bring in our oil markets reporter, Sharon Cho, joining us out of Singapore here right now. And, and Sharon, you know, I think before markets opened, everyone was thinking, you know, we're, we're at a pretty clear pathway to $100 now. But I'm taking a look at this oil market. It seems like they're shrugging off these tensions in the Middle East. What should we be watching out for the next few days or months? That's right, Yvonne. Um, I think a lot of people were surprised when they, you know, um, saw oil futures prices this morning. I think the market was expecting a lot more. Um, and we did see really heightened geopolitical risk premium in the market going into the weekend. But the prices are pretty much muted, like you said, at the moment. 
Um, I think, you know, um, the Iran's attacks were really unprecedented, but it hasn't really affected supply at this moment. And Iran has said that it's pretty much done, concluded in terms of its re re retaliation on Israel. Oh. So um, I think, you know, the oil traders are really watching for um, the reaction from Israel. Um, whether um, there will be significant um, retaliatory moves will be a key thing that's on um, the minds of oil traders and investors going forward. Um, any attacks on, um, you know, the oil producing assets or the Strait of Hormuz will be really, you know, something that everybody will keep a very close eye on. Right. I mean, obviously, as you just said, Sharon, this is Stephen Engel jumping in here. Uh, there was a fairly muted response because uh, of how the, the attack was repelled. But going forward, if there is further uh, retaliation from Israel and, as you said, perhaps attacks on oil assets, is that really the top worry of the oil traders and analysts right now? I think that is fair to say. Um, at the moment, you know, over the weekend, we saw Iranian forces seize a container ship in the in, within the strait. And that was, um, you know, it's very nerve wracking if the supply is affected. And as we know, Iran has been kind of ramping up its production over the last few years. And if the Iranian crude production is affected, crude exports are affected or um, the Strait of Hormuz, the oil flows going into, in and out of the Strait of Hormuz, that's like a fifth of seaborne um, oil shipments. And we have to realize that, you know, uh, 14 million to 15 million barrels a day of um, oil comes from the Middle East to Asia, and a lot of it passes through the Strait of Hormuz. So if that's impacted, mm -hmm. if that's blocked, then that's a big worry for the global oil traders. All right. Sharon Cho, thank you. Our oil markets reporter. I also want to thank our Bloomberg editor, Christine Burke, joining us early from Riyadh here this morning. You can also turn to your Bloomberg for more on this. You can go to T Live Go to get commentary analysis from our expert editors on the situation with this Iran attack right now. Some other stories that we're tracking for you this morning. The U.S. says China is providing Russia with significant quantities of components to build cruise missiles, drones, tanks, and armored vehicles. Now, it's urging Chinese firms to seize their support for Moscow's war against Ukraine. Washington is also encouraging European allies to put pressure on Beijing to end sales from companies that are providing critical components for Russian military systems. China's top legislator met North Korean leader Kim Jong-un on Saturday, according to Chinese state media. China's third-ranking official Zhao Lejun met with Kim on the last day of what it calls a goodwill visit to Pyongyang. Zhao is the highest-ranking Chinese official to visit North Korea since President Xi visited in 2019. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. The world's largest battery maker, China CATL, could see continued profit growth in the first quarter. It's due to unveil its latest earnings later on today. Let's bring in our Asia transport reporter, Danny Lee, here with a preview. Obviously, this has been a company that's been able to deliver profits despite these price wars going on. Can that continue? I mean, the expectation with uh, the handful of estimates is, yes, it can do so. Um, and over the previous quarter, the final quarter of last year, it uh, overshot its, uh, uh, its expectations. So it was very robust in its performance. Uh, whether it will continue to see this, this momentum is, an, is another matter because what we've seen from some of the peers, some of the rivals, such as LG Energy in South Korea, they saw a big profit drop. Uh, they guided towards that uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, I mean, if CATO doesn't follow that trend and, and you know, even just holds flat, that's a good performance given what we've seen in China in terms of, as you say, price wars, but also as we've seen in terms of weaker sales in this first quarter period. Well, Danny, how does CATO weather this better than like LG Energy Solutions in the sense of maybe scale or what? Yes, yeah, scale is a big factor for them in already being the dominant supplier to a whole range of companies or like Tesla, Volts. Uh, and, and, and more, Toyota, for example, but the fact that it has also now become the biggest 
uh, seller globally outside of China of EV batteries means it can you know, keep that kind of, uh, you know, not just cost control, but that, that price control, that it has a price advantage uh, where you know, in China there is a lot of price competition. So its Chinese customers will be wanting to uh, you know, see bigger discounts on, on batteries, but it can hold that kind of pricing internationally. And that's a key importance, you know, where it's got a balance of not just what's going on in China, but the rest of the world. How do you think they're dealing with the geopolitical tensions, right? Um, obviously, tech curbs and the life in the U.S. Um, I mean, it's given this, their presence in, in overseas markets is quite big. Can they continue to secure more of the domestic sort of, or, or domestic more uh, offshore or international sort of players, or do they diversify out of China more, or can they? Yeah, I mean, what we have seen is, despite the the issues with the U.S. and its partnership with Ford, which is you know, still ongoing, we spoke to the the founder and chairman, uh, Robin Zung, last month. We've not seen any interruption in terms of their, their plans internationally. And you know, uh, Robin Zung has said that they're going to still press forward in all kinds of production and looking to kind of scale up even more. So I don't think we're going to see uh, CTO looking to slow down because if you're going to slow down now, you essentially give up your advantage. Mm. All right. Danny, thank you. Danny Lee there, Asia Transport Reporter, on what to expect out of CATL later on. And we actually are seeing that stock, I think the biggest move up we've seen in a, in a month or so ahead of those results as well. On top of just CATL, we're learning a little bit more about obviously TSMC. Could be seeing some strong first quarter results due to its advanced chip packaging technology. Uh, also earnings to watch as well. Infosys and Wipro will also kick off the India earning season. Meanwhile in the U.S., it's more about the Wall Street banks that's going to be reporting their results in the likes of Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley. And that's after net interest income missed analyst estimates for peers, including J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo Although Citi's profit did top expectations, results may show investment banking activity picking up as the market gets used to high interest rates. So perhaps that's why the markets are kind of shrugging off a little bit of these geopolitical concerns as they're focusing more on, on growth and fundamentals as well as the earnings picture coming up as well. Um, one thing they're watching very closely, of course, I'm guessing, is going to be about what the Apple story and how that plays out. Um, this, this line that came through, in the last couple of hours about iPhone shipments slipping some 10 percent uh, is certainly going to be something that people are talking about. This is according to IDC, uh, it's talking about the global smartphone market rebound in the first quarter. But we're still talking about Apple recording its steepest decline among the top smartphone brands as well. Steve. What do you make of all this? I mean, I'm well, guessing some of it has to do with weakness in China. Too. Absolutely. I mean, we saw that in the first six weeks of this year, the Apple iPhone sales in China were down 24 uh, percent. Some of the other domestic players like a Vivo, uh, which is more in the budget area, they were took a lot of market share. And and it's very rare move. Apple actually in January offered extremely rare discounts on their web store yeah. for iPhones. When, when, when was the last time you got a discount for your latest iPhone? But they're right. having to do do that in China. Uh, so that's it's a it's a big issue, obviously, uh, for Apple in one of its biggest and you know most profitable in the past markets. Uh, and you have to look globally now. Samsung taking over that number one spot and Apple falling back. Yep. And so you got to wonder, are more discounts in store? Obviously, these Apple suppliers are certainly feeling it here today. Uh, we were talking about some pretty sizable declines when it comes to some of the ones listed in Hong Kong as well. Study Optical, the, the more like we're down some 2% there. Samsung Electronics is down some 2.5% or more. SK Hynix also down some 2% in Seoul. we got plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Well, Boston Fed President Susan Collins says it's too soon to tell if the latest hot U.S. inflation print is a bump in the road or a sign of something more concerning. Collins spoke on Friday on how that could impact the Fed's rate cut path. The inflation numbers that came in this week were on what I would call the high end of what was expected. And if you look at the first quarter, uh, certainly inflation is elevated compared to where it was uh, as we ended 2023. At the same time, it doesn't change my baseline outlook that inflation will continue to come down with a healthy labor market. I just think it will take more time. And uh, it's premature to tell whether the elevation 
related numbers that we just saw are a bump along that path or something more concerning. So I don't see it as a significant turn, but important to continue, continue to look at the data holistically and let the data tell us what's really going on. Well, you said yesterday that the danger of over-tightening has kind of moved out of the picture at this point. Growth is strong, unemployment remains low, inflation is at least sticky, if nothing else. Why cut rates at all? So I wouldn't say that the uh, that there is no risk of us, of, you know, uh, waiting too long. I do think that it's uh, two-sided, but. To your point, I certainly do see more reason to focus on um, making sure that we don't uh, start easing too quickly. We're resolute. I'm certainly resolute about that commitment to bring inflation back down to 2%. You know, I do see policy as being moderately restrictive at this point, and it, in my view, will be appropriate as we get closer uh, to that trajectory. It will be appropriate to begin easing but we're not there yet. So I don't think that we would indefinitely certainly want to, to stay where we are. Um, I, my baseline would still have us starting to ease later this year, but when I see as likely to be later than I had been previously thinking. Susan Collins, the Boston Fed president there. And let's look at some of the other top stories we're following around the world. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says nothing is off the table in response to China's manufacturing capacity. Speaking with CNN, Yellen suggested that includes the possibility of additional tariffs to stem a flood of goods into the U.S. market. Sources tell us the issue of China's overcapacity may be discussed at the IMF and World Bank meetings in Washington this week. U.S. Speaker Mike Johnson says the House will vote this week on aid for Israel and may add funds for Ukraine as part of the package. Johnson spoke on Fox News and Iran's attack on Israel gives Johnson added momentum for an alternative to a Senate pass aid package that includes funds for Israel, Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific. The House Republicans and the Republican Party understand the necessity of standing with Israel. We are going to try again uh, this week, and uh, the, the details of that package are being put together right now. We're looking at the options and all these supplemental issues. And obviously we've been tracking, of course, what the Israel response is going to be this morning, what Forbes could take, when is it going to happen. We've also heard from the Chinese about what happened yes. over the weekend as well. What did you make of their comment? A fairly muted comment, actually. You heard from the F Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as the uh, Chinese ambassador to the United Nations. And it was not nearly as forceful as what we heard from Friday when Wang Yi spoke to Antony Blinken after the attack in Damascus that killed several Iranian generals. Uh, they, at the time, well, Wang Yi said he strongly condemned that attack. Now, this attack, when it's a reprisal attack from terror Iran uh, to Israel, they said they have deep concern. Hmm. Uh, and so it was just a bit of a verbiage. But we all obviously know that uh, Beijing has strong ties to Tehran. Uh, Tehran, uh, Iran sells 90% of its oil exports to China. Yeah. Uh, China played a key role in brokering uh, detente between Tehran and Saudi Arabia. There are ties there. And they, the United States has urged China to use more of its influence in Tehran to dial down and de-escalate uh, and vice versa. China has also asked the United States to try and use its influence on Israel to de-escalate. So uh, there wasn't a lot. Maybe we'll get more today in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, briefing in Beijing. Yeah. Uh, but right now, a fairly muted response from, and a safe response, I should say, from Beijing. Yeah, and it's been pretty muted across oil markets, as you can see. Maybe perhaps you, you're seeing that diplomacy being put um, into place here, not just between with China, but also with, with Iran itself. I mean, just hours before this direct attack, we actually did actually hear that this was well telegraphed as well. The fact that, you know, Israel was able to actually deflect 99% of those attacks uh, does show that maybe that's why we're not seeing that sort of reaction, um, a fierce reaction uh, across markets here this morning. So you take a look at how Brent is doing. We're still continuing those declines. We're still holding around 90 bucks right now. Uh, we're watching very close to these oil plays as well, which are still catching a bid here this morning. Energy stocks, the clear outperformer among Asia. And you take a look at what we've been seeing when it comes to CSI 300, and we're, we're still seeing some decent gains 
I believe. There you go. Session highs, around 2%. So we, we've seen Beijing renewing regulatory support. That certainly is one thing we're watching very closely as well, talking about you know market supervision and intensifying that. Um, but we are seeing quite a bit of recovery here after seven days of losses on shore. Uh, we're also watching the likes of property stocks with China Wanco. That certainly is uh, you know what the outperformer here. But we're still seeing some green. We come off a bit. Um, but that is helping at least lift some of these developers here this morning, talking and addressing those liquidity woes as well. And we're watching the likes of High Tung, Citic Securities as well. Uh, they've been put on watch on a probe from regulators here uh, for allegedly some violations there. So certainly that's one to watch. We're watching some of these uh, brokerages here today. I'm not sure what that first one is, titanium dioxide. I don't think that's a brokerage. It might be just a typo. Uh, but we are seeing quite a sizable moves there when it comes to that stock. We're down some 10%. This morning, GMM's looking like this here. We talked about CSI 300. That seems to be the sort of standout here today against this risk aversion when it comes to equities on, on the back of those Middle East tensions. The dollar still catching a slight bit, at least holding on to those gains across Asia FX. We talk about metals still very much front and center with the UK and the US implementing those sanctions on Russian metal. You're feeling that when it likes of aluminum, copper, nickel this morning, and sovereign bonds coming off, but slightly a slight bid, safe haven bid. Across Across bond markets here this morning. That's it for us here from China's, China's show. Bloomberg Markets Asia is next.